my apologies ahead of time. I am fighting off a cold, so I might sound a little congested, and that's because I am. Uh, check it out, though. For Christmas, I got a Daruma doll. Um, it's really cute. Um, I'm gonna... Jeez. My mail decided to come today. Right now, at this moment, as I'm filming. Um, if you don't know what a Daruma doll is, though, it's, uh, it's based off of Bodhidharma. Uh, I'll get into it eventually, uh, because I find the story of Bodhidharma very fascinating. But you fill in, they come with two blank eyes. You fill in one eye when you start a goal, and you, uh, fill in the other eye when you end a goal, or end that goal. And, uh, the goal is 500 subscribers. I think that should be fun. I don't think that there's, like, a thing against saying, like, what it is. Um, I just thought <coughs> I'd bring that one up just because I thought it was a little fun. Hey folks, my name is Dennis, and I'm a bit of a history buff. I'm very into local history, which I know not a lot of folks are into. Uh, whenever there's someone who's LA based on the internet, uh, they always want to talk about LA, but it's a huge city with a lot of history. Quite a bit of hidden history as well. So today we're going to look at the lesser known history of a historical landmark in the LA area, San Anita Park, which is a racetrack. I know, where am I going with this one? Well. You'll see in a bit. We're going to zoom by some major points in history, but basically when Mexico gained independence and they kicked out the Catholic Church, they divided the land that the church owned into ranches or rancheros. Then when California was annexed by the US government, the ranches were then sold again by the Californian government. One of those ranches was Rancho Santa Anita, which was once part of Mission San Gabriel, which is some six miles away. This should give you some perspective on how much land the Catholic Church actually owned while conducting a genocide. Don't worry, we'll talk about life for mission Indians sometime in the future, but today's not that day. Rancho San Anita was eventually acquired by gold prospector Elias Jackson Lucky Baldwin in 1904, and he built a racetrack at that site in 1907. Although Lucky doesn't seem to be all that lucky because it was closed in 1909 and it was then burnt down in 1912. The racetrack was later built at its current location next door to the original one in 1934 in a new Art Deco style, one year after California legalized gambling. Then in 1940, Seabiscuit won the Santa Anita Handicap after failing two previous attempts. Way to go Seabiscuit. Now if you look here at Santa Anita Park's website, you basically see nothing historically significant happens at Santa Anita Park until 1969 when Tuesday Testa becomes the very first female jockey to win a race at the park. Way to go Tuesday, really pushing that women's lib movement, uh, even though the women's lib movement really only focused on the rights of white women, but we'll get around to that in the feminine mystique one of these days. Again, today's not the day. We have something very important to talk about though. I'm also a bit delirious from the cold, so. <sighs> So, despite what this website might lead you to believe, there was something extremely important that was happening at San Anita Park during this time. So let's reverse back a bit to February 19th, 1942. It is two months after the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, and on this day, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signs Executive Order 9066, authorizing authorities to exclude civilians from any area without trial or hearing. What this did was give the police and military power to arrest any civilians, though it was mostly used on Japanese Americans, the Issei, the first generation Japanese Americans, and the Nisei, the second generation. Now I've mentioned in a previous video, but at this time all Asians were barred from naturalization, meaning they could never become full citizens, even if they were born on American soil. This along with a history of distrust of Japanese workers by labor unions in California and the recent Pearl Harbor attacks meant that there was basically no public pushback of this egregious overreach of power by the military and police. The Japanese were rounded up and sent to assembly centers. Assembly centers were pre-concentration camps. They were not meant to be permanent locations. The Japanese would be sent there until a more permanent concentration camp could be built. By the way, you're going to notice that I'm going to switch between the terms concentration camp and internment camp. We can split hairs here, but the definition is identical, and I have a feeling that the U.S. prefers to say internment camp over concentration camp just because of its association with Nazi Germany. I'll also be switching between the terms prisoner, internee, and interned, though my sentiment behind this is all the same. These people were illegally imprisoned because of their race. I also really don't want to hear any bullshit like, oh well compared to the Jews in Nazi Germany, I'd rather be a Japanese person in America at this time. That is a highly ignorant statement that ignores the pain, suffering, and indignity that the Japanese went through. To misquote a 
enlightened thinker, no group of human beings has the monopoly on human suffering. So we can just at least agree that what happened to them was awful. So what was life at Santa Anita Park like? Well, it was pretty bad. Of course, I could mention the good things, like the baseball team, the sumo wrestling teams, a newspaper, a PTA, a regular K-12, through and church services for Catholics, Protestants, and Buddhists, however absolutely no Shinto. But that's just the rose-tinted propaganda that uh, you know the US government liked to share with people. There were these things, that's for sure, but it only made life tolerable at best. At Santa Anita Park, barrack-style housing was built for the Japanese on the parking lot, but because there was a huge number of people, roughly 18,000 Japanese, many had to live in converted horse stalls. Robert Wagner wrote in a 1942 issue of West Coast Magazine, Box stalls don't sound very appetizing as living quarters, but you'd be surprised if you saw what the army has done with them. Each stall has had a room built in the front with doors and windows, and the floors have been covered with a layer of asphaltum, which seems to have killed the odors. Despite this, many people living in the stables reported their housing smelled like horse shit, and they had to live there for six months until they were moved to a more permanent concentration camp. To keep internees busy, one of the things that the government made the Japanese do was make camo netting, used in war as well as general groundskeeping on the place. Internee James Tsutsui said of his life at Santa Anita Park, I was working on a gardening crew, and we were assigned to trim a huge hedge. It was an oleander hedge that lined the northern perimeter of the track and there was a chain link fence that was eight or ten feet tall with barbed wire on top. We were given makeshift ladders that were made out of two by fours and given lopping shears and hedge shears. One day I was up on a ladder and I was topping the oleander and of course the oleander would grow outside the fence and I was leaning over the fence trying to top the oleander when I heard a voice say get back inside that fence and there I saw a armed guard a military policeman and I said all I'm trying to do is trim the oleanders like we were told to do and the only way to trim is to reach over. At which point he worked the bolt of his rifle, chambered around, brought his rifle up to ready, and said, I told you to get back inside that fence. Well, naturally, I climbed right down. I put down my lopping shears and I didn't work anymore that day. Accommodations for the Japanese were also completely abysmal. Six mess halls were built at Santa Anita, which could only accommodate 850 people, but each served 3,000 people per day. The Santa Anita Pacemaker, the Assembly Center's newspaper, described the facilities as having limited seating and a lack of equipment. Bathing facilities were even less adequate, with only 150 shower rooms for 18,000 people. That's a ratio of about one shower head for every 30 inmates. Later, six more shower buildings were built each with 75 shower heads, but that only lowered this ratio to one shower head per 22 inmates. Healthcare was also completely inadequate, with the chief complaint amongst imprisoned people being digestive issues and fever. By June 2nd, 1942, 235 of the detainees had to be hired to take care of the growing sick population. Prior to this, only 69 people were hired as medical staff. That's a ratio of 23 medical staff for six thousand people. Near the end of the six months stay at Santa Anita, 8,262 incarcerated Japanese received over 25,000 medical treatments. 3,000 received mental health treatments, 37 died, and 194 were born. On August 4th, 1942, there was an unannounced inspection of housing under the guise of searching for contraband like hot plates which were said to be overloading the circuit. However, James Tsutsui said that the items that were confiscated were valuables and heirlooms. The taking of valuables and other factors, such as the poor food rations and a rumor that was going around that the guards were taking supplies that were meant for the prisoners, led to a riot in the camp. Much of the violence was aimed at a man named Henry Kawaguchi, a Japanese-Korean man who was a police informant, according to the FBI. Kawaguchi was beaten with chairs and assaulted with dishes and typewriters. He was brutally beaten until the guards finally came to stop the violence. After the riot, 
riot, the camp was under complete police control for two days. By October 1942, the last of the prisoners were moved from the park and sent on trains and buses to more permanent camps that were built across the U.S. After the mass movement of the Japanese, the racetrack was used by the U.S. government to train troops. Many Japanese did not know life outside of the fences of a concentration camp for another four years. Eventually, in 1946, the Japanese were allowed to return to their homes. After spending years away from their houses, they found them vandalized with racial slurs graffitied on the walls or destroyed completely. They had to start life all over again, many moving to the East Coast, the South, or Mexico to escape any lingering anti-Japanese sentiment in the West. Part of Santa Anita's property was sold to a development firm that built a shopping mall in the 1970s that was named Santa Anita Fashion Park. It was later bought by Westfield and renamed Westfield Santa Anita, though in the area we just called the Santa Anita Mall. The mall is currently located where the Southern Barracks were. This entire story goes pretty much unmentioned in all of San Anita Parks or San Anita Mall's various historical documentation. The city of Arcadia, where the racetrack and the mall are located, fares slightly better. Both the city website and the library archive copies of the San Anita Pacemaker, and they have also dedicated an exhibit to internment in their city museum. However, there are no large monuments dedicated to the interned Japanese, no day of remembrance in Arcadia, just a small plaque outside of the gates of the stadium at the racetrack that reads, Early in 1942, the U.S. government designated Santa Anita Park for special usage during the war year. Pursuant to Executive Order 9066, signed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt from March 30, 1942 until October 27, 1942. The facility was used as an assembly and processing center for approximately 20,000 Japanese Americans prior to their displacement to internment camps in other areas of the country. From 1942 until 1945, the government utilized the property as an army base, Camp Santa Anita. It was the largest army ordnance training center on the west coast and more than 100,000 soldiers were trained there. Racing resumed at Santa Anita on May 15, 1945, just after VE Day. This plaque is placed at Santa Anita in remembrance of the events of that period in history by its dedication on this, the 15th day of May, 2001. That's it, just one single sentence to summarize the brutal imprisonment of a racial minority. Not an apology, no words of regret. They even had to share a plaque with the statement about training more troops, you know, the people who were responsible for putting Japanese people in these concentration camps in the first place. This really isn't a plaque in remembrance for the Japanese imprisoned at Santa Anita. This is just erasure and whitewashing of history. Par for the course when it comes to the imprisonment of minorities here in America. In the years following World War II, reparations were given to the Issei and Nisei, and California, Hawaii, Florida, and Virginia recognized Fred Korematsu Day, named after the Japanese American man who sued the U.S. government over Executive Order 9066 and won. We're going to go over Korematsu and his life in another video. Going forward, the internment of the Japanese cannot be forgotten or just briefly mentioned. Many Japanese Americans raised the question after their imprisonment, who's next? And unfortunately many are still alive to see exactly who is next. And that's going to do it for me today. If you enjoyed this video and would like to learn a little bit more about Japanese internment, please like and subscribe as I'm going to be talking about Japanese internment all this month in remembrance of Fred Korematsu Day. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider donating to my Patreon like Abby, Nicholas, Psychic Dolphin Garage, and cool kid, Jorge. Jorge is a cool kid because he donates at the $6.66 level, so he gets this uh, devil drawing. If you cannot afford a monthly donation, then please consider a one-time donation via coffee or just sharing this video with a friend or loved one. Any small amount of money or even just sharing the video really does help me out. Like I said, we're going to continue this theme of Japanese internment, so next week I'm going to actually be talking about the No-No Boys. Should be a fun and interesting short video. Remember folks, never stop fighting for justice and to take care. and goodbye.